I've never been afraid around the volcano. It's like looking into the gates of hell, you know, there's just uh, something about that that's intriguing and mysterious. We want to tell these stories that we think will do good. We both grew up on geographic. We grew up on all these wonderful natural history documentaries that really had a mission of trying to better our world and better the planet. And then there's an, one other aspect to it that I realized as well. It's, it's the exhilaration of knowing that y you were afraid and you did it anyway yeah. and you came through the other end and everything's okay. Part of my job as a photojournalist is to explain to people who can't see it. I was able to be the eyes of millions of people. I mean, there, there are not many people around who have had their, as many images looked at as me. I worked for the Associated Press, and on any given day, my picture could be on the front of, of 2,000 newspapers around the country, as well as television stations. There are eyewitnesses to the wonders of the natural world and compelling moments in human history. We'll recall conversations with four visual storytellers, next on Long Story Short. One-on-one -on -one engaging conversations with some of Hawaii's most intriguing people. Long Story Short with Leslie Wilcox. Aloha my kako, I'm Leslie Wilcox. On this special edition of Long Story Short, we revisit conversations with four people who, sometimes at great personal risk, captured stunning images of stories that shaped our world. Self-described volcanographer McKelver, who lives near newly created lava outside Pahoa on Hawaii Island. Natural history filmmakers Grace and Paul Atkins of East Honolulu, and Pulitzer Prize-winning photojournalist Ron Edmonds of Fairfax, Virginia. We start with Mick Kalber. Since 1984, Kalber has spent many hours in the seat of a helicopter with doors removed to record footage of Kilauea Volcano for his own documentary series, as well as for news coverage and social media. Kalber followed in the footsteps of his newscaster father and worked as a television journalist in Omaha, Nebraska, and eventually as a news photographer and producer for a hit magazine television program in Denver, Colorado. That success, though, brought brutal work schedules that led to burnout and substance abuse. During our 2016 conversation, Mick Kelber talks about his recovery and building a career by telling a continuing visual story of the world's most active volcano. I'm in my 30th year of sobriety now. I moved here 32 years ago, so I lived here for only about two years before I got into AA. Everything was going south. That was part of the reason I moved here was I was in Denver. I was drinking. I was using mostly marijuana. Got into a little bit of cocaine. I visited a friend out of, of mine on the Big Island. I, I loved the Big Island. And I said, I'm going to leave here and, you know, get out of Dodge and go out and have a great life in Hawaii and live on the beach and get healthy and, you know, yada, yada. But my disease came right along with me. and. Um, before you knew it, I was doing the same old things again. Um, my ex, uh, we were separated at the time. She actually moved out and we put the kids in school. My kids were in a Waldorf school in, at Malama Lama School in Paradise Park. I did get sober during that time, and, um, and I haven't had a drink or a drug other than the medicine that's prescribed for me for my throat and stuff since then. What happened in, in pretty short order was I, I got there in March of 84 and Mauna Loa was erupting. At some point, Kilauea erupted. It was doing high fountaining eruptions back then and Kilauea erupted at the same time. And I went, oh man, I've got to get some equipment. Called up Kent Baker at Channel, at Channel 2. 2 and said, I'm here on the Big Island, I'm for real and I can shoot for you. And lo and behold, one day he called me up and said, go get in a helicopter and, and go shoot the volcano. And I did, and I was totally blown away. Never seen anything like that in my life. Coming from Omaha and Denver and like, oh, you know, 1,000 foot fountain, 1,200 foot fountain. It was amazing. And there were people at that time that had other videos out that had I fountain eruption in them. And I thought, you know, what can I do that's any different than that? But eventually it, it created a fissure eruption, made a lava lake, rolled down the hill, took a couple houses and went in the ocean. I said, well, now I got a story. So I, um, 
I put together a show. And the show was uh, my first Volcano Escape show, Pele's March to the Pacific. It was about a 40 minute show. And it uh, took me a while, but um, it was very well received. And people were snapping them up like crazy. You don't advertise yourself as a videographer. You are a volcanographer. Because I, I made that up. That's you know that's my own creation, and it, because I think it more aptly describes what I do. You know, I'm not a volcanologist. Don't get me wrong. You know, but I've been around it long enough. I've seen a lot of stuff that I I kind of have an insight to it. I've made my living basically for the past 30 years over 30 years, shooting Kilauea Volcano. It's what I do. And so, yeah, I'm a volcanographer. We fly uh, basically wherever we want to because we're on a media flight, it's a charter flight, and so we can fly at any altitude. And we do, we go down as close as we can to shoot what we shoot. Have you ever been in but, danger? Have you really felt danger? Because if well, where you fall is gonna be into fire. Exactly, and it's and it's 2,000 degree uh, hot liquid rock with- And with auto jet, rotation won't help you. With jet fuel, you know? Yeah. Jet fuel and hot, li yeah. not a good You'd combo. Go fast. The, there was one time when uh, my pilot, John Greenway, was flying me with Hilo Bay Air, was flying me over Kupayanaha, which was a lava lake in the shape of a key. They call it the, the key vent as well. And we were flying over the neck of the key, which is probably 80 or 100 feet across or something. And he got halfway across it and he stopped. He hovered because another helicopter was coming in front of him. And this was early on. This is the first three, four years that I'd been flying. And I didn't know anything about airspeed at the time. And so when he hovered, I looked down below me and I went, oh man, you know, if the engine quits, we're toast, you know, we're, we're done. And, um, and uh, yeah, it scared me. And when we got across that, nothing happened, obviously. When we got across that, I said something to him about that. And he said, oh, we had 30 knots of airspeed. And should anything have happened, I could have auto-rotated down to one side or the other. So it really wasn't a problem. But I didn't know that. And so it's psychologically, you know, and, and it's unnerving. There are people who go with us who can't. We fly with the doors off because mm -hmm. you can't shoot through the window, you know. So we fly doors off and we go close to it. And there's people who can't do that. They can't fly with us. We also stand, I don't stand on the struts because in the, the helicopter we fly on now, they're too far down. But when I flew in a jet ranger, we would stand on the struts. And so you're basically standing outside the helicopter with And you're with tied us. up, right? Well, I have a seat belt on. I don't have a harness on. I don't wear a harness. Seat belt with a piece of tape around it so it doesn't accidentally come off, you know? With, with I mean, duct tape? Well, like gaffer tape, yeah, duct tape. Whoa. <laughs> well, it's, it's not, not going anywhere, you know? As long as you keep the buckle closed, you know? Are you going to go up as, as long as you can? As long as the oh. volcano's willing? Yeah, I guess. I mean, I don't know how, you know, I'm getting to the age where, where it's not so easy to hike out like I used to. You know, I used to hike out by myself four or five miles, you know, and, and the hike is going, if it comes down right now, it's going to be about a, it's probably going to be about a five mile hike to go see it. And what about hanging out of the helicopter? Well, that's easy. <laughs> and no, it is. I mean, it, flying in the helicopter, we fly for an hour. You know, I can go fly for an hour and hold the camera. That's, I love that, that's fun. McKelver flew nearly every day of the four month long 2018 eruption of Kilauea Volcano in Lower Puna on Hawaii Island to provide footage to worldwide news outlets. Later, he started working on a new documentary chronicling the volcano's eruption dating back to 1983. Up next, trailblazing independent filmmakers Paul and Grace Atkins, who trekked across the globe to swim with great white sharks, dolphins, and killer whales. They've spent months and sometimes years at a time capturing the spectacle of the natural world, as well as underscoring for audiences the fragility of our endangered environment. In our 2016 conversation, these partners in life shared how they created documentaries for National Geographic, the BBC, and public broadcasting for more than 30 years. I was determined to be a marine biologist and I was working on my doctorate. 
I just started to feel, even as much as I loved the ocean, and I loved the people I was working with, I loved scuba diving, and I loved being out in the field, the, the idea that I was going to eventually end up getting a job and, and being you know, on a faculty somewhere was not really my dream of the sort of life that I want, wanted to, to, to lead. And then I picked up you know, the department's movie camera. Uh, because we used to use the camera to film fish underwater for the research that we were doing, coral reef fish. And it wasn't long before uh, I started to realize that this is what I really want to do. I knew I wanted to do natural history or I wanted to do science documentaries. And at the time I went to school, there was really no definitive program that taught you how to uh, do natural history films. I think it was Stanford that had one graduate uh, course that I took in science communications. But other than that, it was, it was a field that was wide open. So when we started, we were really kind of like forging our way into a, a new world, a new way of making films, and, and basically had to do it all on our own. And I think it was the combination of, you know, uh, just having the courage really to try it because now you were a team, now you were two people. Mm -hmm. And Gracie brought in a sense that I didn't really have, which was a, a business sense about uh, finances, how to use a credit card. I didn't even have a credit card, much less know how to use one, you know. And about the same time, I was introduced to Arthur Jones, who was a billionaire inventor of Nautilus exercise machines. And he was spending a lot of his money that he was making on Nautilus exercise machines on a television studio in Lake Helen, Florida. And he was going all over the world just filming things. And he showed up in Hawaii, and uh, Bruce Carlson at the Waikiki Aquarium introduced me to him. And so um, Arthur hired me for a couple of days to be a grip, mm -hmm. and I started to learn a little bit more about video cameras. The name of his company was Nautilus, because it was mm -hmm. the cam of his exercise machines. It's based on the spiral design I of a Nautilus shell. <laughs> Arthur decided he wanted to mount an expedition to go to Palau to bring Chambers Nautilus back to be at his studio in Lake Helen, Florida, so he could have them in a big aquarium there. I said, well, why don't we do a documentary about mm -hmm. this trip, about the, the expedition to catch live Nautilus, and he said, I said, fine. And I said, I want to shoot it. And he said, sure. <laughs> you know, I, we barely knew what we were doing, but over the course of a couple of trips down there, we managed to get enough footage to put together, you know, uh, a, a semblance of a documentary. Wasn't that an award-winning documentary? Yes. Yeah, actually. but not until uh, we showed it to uh, Jim Young, yeah. who was, uh, you know, the executive director of Hawaii Public Television at that time. And Jim became a big supporter. There was no model for how nothing. to do this at all. Yeah. There, there, weren't there was even no YouTube. There was no internet. There was no online courses, and very few yeah. productions that were going on too. Yeah. And there weren't that many natural history films being produced. This mm -hmm. is the very beginning. You know, cable had not exploded yet. What are some of the other um, adventures you've had together? I think one of our most difficult and challenging films, and yet one of the most satisfying in the long term because it turned out so well, was one we did on Dolphins for Geographic. We wanted to take a film that looked at the opposite of what the, the public perception of an animal was. For example, like dolphins. Dolphins are always thought to be sweetness and light, and everybody loves a dolphin. So we wanted to look at the darker side of dolphins, which meant we were not only just mm -hmm. looking at uh, at uh, Terciops, we were looking at uh, all the dolphin family and spent two years of our lives making this film. So we, we went out to this, uh, this, this location and um, we built a camp there and, and the scientist was with us and said this is the best time of year for you to be able to see dolphins hurting fish. And we had never heard of uh, dolphins actually coming and hurting fish onto shore just like the killer whales had done in, in Patagonia. And for weeks we were trying to, you know, see this action happen and it wasn't happening. And so the scientists said, well, something must not be right. We're at, not at the right time of season. So we had, I can't tell you what it takes to get an expedition all the way out to a remote location like that. The weeks and the months of planning and then also the physical actual moving out there and setting up your camps and, and getting all your gear ready and then doing the shooting. You need, you need to bring all your food, your water. You know, solar showers, generators, all of that out there, charging batteries, all of that just... Because there's nobody, nothing out there. So, okay, so we're there for two weeks and decide that, oh, well, this is not 
going to happen this time, so we're going to have to come back at another time. So we did that, but this time we came very prepared with all the things we needed to survive out there, including tents, which we didn't have before that we could eat in because there are all these flies out there. So we, were, we lived out on this location for like two months, and you become a you become connected with an environment like you never would because there's nobody out there, just us. And these dolphins, and the dolphins, sure enough, came in, a family of dolphins, and they would come in and they would herd the fish. And we were on this huge, long beach, maybe 300 feet of beach. And these dolphins would come in and uh, herd the fish, and Paul would be out there with his camera. Anne Marie, our assistant who was working with us, she and I would be up on the hills spotting and telling him where the dolphins were coming and where they were going. And he would have run up and down the beach trying to film them because as soon as he would get up to film them, the dolphins would see him and would go to another section of the beach. And so there would be Paul with his camera gear, humping it all the way down to the other side of the beach. And finally, you know, we got the footage. But this, after two trips. After two trips. Yeah. Had anyone ever gotten? These photos, no, be, these uh, no, this film no, before? No. no, I'm in love with with camera work and sto visual storytelling, no matter what it involves. I love working with actors, and I work with a lot of directors like Terrence Malick, who give their actors a lot of freedom, um, both in dialogue and in movement. So, as a cameraman, you never, it, you, it's not like you have marks on the floor. Then You're your not background sure what, is great for that. My background yeah. is like I know how to do this because mm -hmm. I filmed animals before. Exactly. <laughs> You don't really think of it as a risk. You think of the adventure. You think of what you're getting to to film, what you're going to be, you know, making. It's been more about telling a story that will do something better for the world. And it just so happens that some of the things involved a little bit more risky, you know, uh, endeavors. The exhilaration of knowing that y you were afraid and you did it anyway, yeah. and you came through the other end, and everything's okay. There is an mm -hmm. exhilaration to that. Paul and Grace Adkins continue to shoot and produce documentaries in Hawaii and elsewhere and are involved in the development of another documentary about a solution to the climate crisis. Our next guest is Ron Edmonds. He worked for more than 35 years as a news photographer for the old Honolulu Star Bulletin in the 1970s and then for news wire services, ending with a distinguished 28-year run with the Associated Press. During our 2012 conversation at his home in Virginia, he talked about his second day on the job on the White House beat, covering a speech by then President Ronald Reagan. Edmonds won the Pulitzer Prize for the exclusive images he captured that day in 1981 during a failed attempt to assassinate the president. We almost missed the whole event because at the Hilton were downstairs and they always ask people, please stay in your seats till the president and his entourage leaves. Well, as soon as the president walked out, Everybody got up and well, we had to go up two side. There were two flights of escalators to get up to the ground floor where the car was at. Well, by the time we got to the back of the room to go out, because he goes out a secure entrance and we go out a side entrance, the escalators were jammed with people and we were having to say, excuse us, excuse us, because he won't wait. And he came, he waved, and I made one image and the bangs went off and they sounded like firecrackers. It was over so quick you did not have time to really realize what went on. He shot six shots in something like 1.7 seconds. From the first to the last shot, it's only 1.7 seconds. I saw him grimace. So I knew that, I mean, this even if it hadn't been shooting, this was going to be maybe a humorous, what you call a humorous picture of the President of the United States reacting to this, to this bang. Because I saw him, he squeezed his eyes and, and kind of grimaced like that. And uh, it wasn't, I didn't even know they were shots until a limo limo pulled away and you could see the people laying, laying on the ground because they were out of my viewfinder. All I could see was the two agents through the viewfinder. It wasn't until the car pulled away and that's when I went, oh my gosh, because you know, here was Brady laying on the ground and, mm -hmm. and uh, McCarthy, the agent, uh, laying there. And of course then I knew I was, you know, this, was, this is when the adrenaline started pumping. And, and again, this is one of the situations where I had worked with this crew of agents for many months. And for a while, they allowed me, one of my favorite pictures is, uh, of the scene is got, that tells the, kind of the whole story is, is it's got all three of the people wounded laying on the ground and them wrestling with Hinkley in the background. Well, most of the other photographers, even the ones that were coming out late, didn't get that because they got pushed back off to the side by the agents. And I was fortunate enough that I was off to the, 
far side. And for quite a while, the agents who knew me left me out there. So the first agent grabbed me and went, oh, and just moved me aside, realized who I was. Well, you know, he was moving people out of, the, out of the way. So I was able to make those images before they kind of, once they get organized, then they start making press areas where you have to stand and all that. The biggest thing that happened to me that day on my luck site is that when they pushed the president in the car, the motorcade took off and didn't stop for us. Because if the motorcade had stopped, I would have had to get in that van. That's my job to stay with the president. I'd have had none of the aftermath, none of the arresting of Hinckley. And I, I, I know to this day, I, I always tell people, thank God that van didn't stop because I would have had to make that split second decision. And my job is to stay with the president. You never leave the president. How much at physical risk did you turn out to have been during the shooting? Well, I didn't know this till later. Jerry Parr was the lead agent on the thing, and I were pretty good friends. And, he showed me some of the diagrams. Unfortunately for myself and the UPI photographer who was standing right next to me, the one bullet that didn't either hit the car or hit, hit anybody out there went across the street and it went about two feet over my head across the street. It was an intense few moments. And the first time I was ever in gunfire was during the riots in the, in the early 60s in Berkeley and People's Park. And the first time you're around someone shooting and you realize that you can get hit with it. A lot of times you're around those situations, but you kind of stand off and we all kind of had that feeling it's not us, you know, right. we're kind of an observer, we're around it, and, you know, and uh, I was all actually fairly easy with people firing guns, even though a gun can, can kill you. It wasn't until in Iran, I was in Iran for, for a short stint, and uh, it wasn't until we were coming on artillery fire, and that changed the whole world as about what you think about being a bang-bang photographer for me. And in Iran, uh, people there were fighting, I mean, Thousands died in battles over there, and it was just a total, that was a shocker for me the first time I dealt with that kind of loss of life, you know, when you're, you're, you're walking over a battlefield where bodies are laying all over them. And we're not talking about five or ten, we're talking about 15,000, 20,000 people who died in some of those battles, and it, it really opens your eyes to, to how bad war is. When I won the Pulitzer, uh, the president invited me in the Oval Office, and uh, so we had a had a little 10 or 15 minute meeting, just the two of us and, 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 and aides. And he was funny, we used to call him governor and, he, and people would say, governor, look this way, governor, look this way. And, and he said, you know, Ron, he says, I think uh, next time I'm gonna have a stand in for this scene. <laughs> <laughs> so, and then he proceeded to tell me a Cecil B. DeMille joke. But uh, he was a, it, it was very, very nice to the president. He invited me in, talked about it. And so, I, you know, I look back, and it was, it was a big day for me professionally, but I also look at other pictures of, of uh, you know, the handshake between Clinton, Arafat, and Rabin, which was, a, you know, a, a big moment in history. And uh, fortunately, I had a, a center position and uh, ended up on a large majority of the newspapers around the world. Was Here was my picture of, of a historical event. I've made pictures of every president since Nixon, Nixon, Carter, Ford. And then I covered at the White House. I did some photography of, of Carter in his last month. And then I did Reagan, uh, Bush, Clinton, Bush. So it's a... What was, who was your favorite to cover? George Bush Sr. Because of his personal uh, Personal. Manner. He, he, he loved everybody and uh, he was just, he was fun to cover. You know, there's a work and there's a politics and we don't always get along politicking wise. and. Uh, but I, I just, he was a very, very, very good person with everybody around him. Kind of felt like I was always the eyes of people who couldn't get there. You know, I've been moments, I was in, in Berlin when, with Ronald Reagan when he told Gorbachev to tear down the wall. And, you know, I covered volcanoes in Mount St. Helens. I covered the war. I've covered the Olympics. I've covered the Summer Olympics, the Winter Olympics. Uh, I've been to almost all, every, I've covered almost every convention since 1980. And I've got to see things that most people have never seen in their life. You know, traveling down the Nile River with, with the President of the United States chatting with you. Or getting a call one morning from President George Bush Sr. One morning, 8 o'clock in the morning, the phone rings and Grace answers the phone. And she wakes me up and says, it's the White House calling. I said, what, the White House? She says, yeah, the guy on the other end says, it's the White House. So I answered and it was his aide saying, what are you doing today? I said, nothing. He said, the President would like to come over and play horseshoes. So I went and spent, you know, spent the Sunday it was like going to your grandmother's house, you know, we barbecued, we played horseshoes. You know, how many people get to do that? I mean, from the son of a poor truck driver, uh, you know, and here I am sitting having a drink with the President of the United States. That's, uh, 
a pretty, a pretty good, uh, a pretty good career. Now in retirement, Ron Edmonds enjoys traveling with his wife Grace and indulging his love of bass fishing. He embraces this different life with no deadlines. Mahalo to Ron Edmonds of Fairfax, Virginia, Grace and Paul Atkins of East Honolulu, and Mick Kelber of Pahoa, Hawaii Island for sharing their stories with us. And mahalo to you for joining us. For PBS Hawaii and Long Story Short, I'm Leslie Wilcox. Aloha nui. You know, I tell people all the time that if you, you move to the Big Island, you know, you're dealing with the fire energy and it's, it kind of forces your hand. You know, whatever is going on in your life is going to come to a head because of the, the energy that's on that island. We were like two people off doing these kind of films together that if you didn't have a system where you knew exactly what you had to do, how you had to do it, and could rely upon each other completely all the time, you might not even be alive because the, some of the work we did was really dangerous. I used to have a fear of heights. And even, even today, yeah. if I stand on a vertical cliff and look straight down, I, it's not a, it's a mild case of vertigo. And uh, so to film on cliffs, which I've done a lot of, and to film from a helicopter, I had to get over that. I had to really get over it. Most of us do that kind of thing because you want to change it. You know, most of the guys, if people think that the photographers are getting rich covering the war, it's just not happening. Most of them are concerned about what's going on in the world. And if they're not there, things can happen that will never be seen by most public. For audio and written transcripts of all episodes of Long Story Short with Leslie Wilcox, visit pbshawaii.org. To download free podcasts of Long Story Short with Leslie Wilcox, go to the Apple iTunes Store or visit pbshawaii.org.